Welcome to this video on conditions of the elbow, forearm, wrist and hand. In this video, we discuss common causes, diagnostics and treatment options. For more, feel free to subscribe to the channel. And for more videos on the topic of orthopedics in adults, check the description for the video playlist. The information presented in the video is intended for medical education and informational purposes only. It is not suitable for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Please consult with your healthcare provider before making any decisions regarding your health and treatment options. The views and opinions expressed in this video are solely those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any healthcare organization or institution. Introduction The elbow, forearm, wrist and hand are those parts of the musculoskeletal system that are essential for human functioning at a higher motor level. Injuries, both as a result of trauma and chronic overload, are relatively common in the area and have a major influence on quality of life. The objective of this video is to provide insight into common conditions, their natural course and the influence and treatments. Conditions of the elbow, the next chapter. The elbow joint consists of the distal humerus, the ulna and the radius. The ulnohumeral part of the joint allows flexion and extension the radio-ulnar part mainly rotation, pro and supination, while the radio-humeral joint mainly serves as a support point for the radius. Many muscles that are necessary for hand and wrist function are inserted around the elbow, which can cause a relatively large number of overuse injuries around the elbow. Extra-articular disorders of the elbow comprise olecranic bursitis, tennis elbow, golfer's elbow and cubital tunnel syndrome. Olecranon bursitis is an inflammation of the bursa, a fluid-filled sac that cushions the elbow joint. Tennis elbow is an inflammation of the tendons that attach to the bony prominence on the outside of the elbow. Golfer's elbow is an inflammation of the tendons that attach to the bony prominence on the inside of the elbow. And cubital tunnel syndrome is a compression of the ulnar nerve, which runs from the neck of the hand as it passes through the elbow. Olecranon bursitis the normally present bursa olecrani, the cushion behind the elbow, can become inflamed due to the one-off or repeated trauma, such as also called a student's elbow. Purulent bursitis can develop through secondary contamination via a wound or a puncture. Rheumatoid nodules or urate tophi can both occur at the level of the olecranon. When the tophi feel harder, rheumatoid nodules fit into a general clinical picture. Relieving the elbow, possibly puncturing the acute bursitis, is the treatment. In chronically recurrent bursitis, excision is appropriate, and in case of purulent bursitis, it must be drained. The tennis elbow, also called lateral apicondylitis. Tennis elbow is a condition caused by overuse of the muscles that extend the wrist and fingers. It is most common in people between the ages of 40 and 50 and is often associated with work or sport activities that involve repetitive wrist and hand movements. Symptoms of tennis elbow include pain and tenderness over the outside of the elbow, which may worsen with specific movements like extending the elbow and pronating the forearm. Pain around the lateral epicondyle could also be caused by referred pain from the cervical spine, compression of the posterior interosseous nerve or osteoarthritis of the radiohumeral joint. The therapy is explanation, rest and advice to load the forearm as much as possible in the supination and not in the pronation position. A local bandage slightly distal to the lateral epicondyle can provide symptomatic relief by reducing contraction of the musculature and thus stretch at the insertion. Local injections of corticosteroids have a good effect on pain complaints. In treatment resistant cases surgical treatment can be used in which the origin of the wrist and the finger extensors are detached from the lateral epicondyle. The natural course is benign and most patients will no longer have any complaints after two years. Golfer's elbow, medial epicondylitis. This condition is analogous to lateral epicondylitis but it affects the medial side of the elbow. It is characterized by antisopathy of the flexors of the wrist and hand, which originate from the medial epicondyle. To diagnose this condition, the elbow is brought into extension with the forearm in supination. Alternatively, pain on the medial epicondyle can be elicited by forcefully flexing and extending the wrist. It is important to differentiate this condition from referred pain from the cervical spine, osteoarthritis of the ulnohumeral joint and ulnar neuritis. 
The therapy is explanation, rest and advice to load the forearm as much as possible in pronation and not in supination. Local injections of corticosteroids often have a good effect on pain complaints and in treatment resistant cases surgical treatment um, is detachment of the wrist and finger flexors from the medial epicondyle. The natural history is favorable and comparable to that of lateral epicondylitis. Neuropathy of the ulnar nerve, cubital tunnel syndrome. The ulnar nerve travels through the cubital tunnel and passes under the medial epicondyle. When the elbow is flexed or in valgus position, the nerve is stretched. In some instances, the nerve may subluxate or dislocate from its groove. Medial epicondylitis can mimic the symptoms of ulnar nerve compression. Upon examination, there is tenderness to pressure over the ulnar nerve as well as a positive tenel sign, which is characterized by paresthesias in the distribution of the nerve where it is tapped. Muscle weakness is also evident, and particularly when abducting the fingers and thumb or making a fist. This is further demonstrated by a formal sign, where weakness of the adductor pollicis muscle prevents a forceful forceps grip. Sensory loss is also present in the fifth finger and the ulnar aspect of the fourth finger of the hand. Electromyographic examination can be performed to confirm the diagnosis of ulnar nerve compression. And for therapy, advice on the use of the elbow, uh, avoid supporting the elbow, and possibly night splints in extension. In case of clear uh, electromyographic abnormalities, surgical decompression of the nerve is recommended, possibly transpositioning of the nervous ulnaris to prevent overstretching. Next chapter is on conditions of the forearm. Rower's wrist, intersection syndrome or Orsman's wrist. A common condition known as intersection tendocynovitis arises from local irritation at the intersection of tendons on the dorsal radial side of the forearm. The irritation results in inflammation of the tendons, causing pain and sometimes swelling in the area slightly proximal to the extensor retinaculum of the wrist. Typically, the pain is located approximately four fingers proximal to the radiostyloid process. Differential diagnosis for intersection tendosynovitis include the Cravain's tendovaginitis, which is an inflammation of the tendon surrounding the thumb, and isolated neuropathy of the superficial branch of the radial nerve. Treatment for intersection tendosynovitis typically involves conservative measures such as rest, avoiding excessive strain, and the use of NSAIDs to manage pain and inflammation. In some cases, relief splints may be recommended to further reduce strain on the tendons. Conservative treatment is generally effective in resolving the condition. The Quervain tendovaginitis, also known as stenosing tenosynovitis, is an inflammation of the tendon sheet surrounding the thumb. It occurs at the styloid process of the radius, where the tendons of the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis muscles pass through a narrow tendon sheet. Overload of these tendons, often caused by repetitive motion of the thumb and wrist, lead to inflammation, thickening and stenosis of the tendon sheet. This condition typically affects women between the ages of 30 and 50 years. Symptoms include swelling and a palpable thickening of the tendon sheet along with pain provoked by Finkelstein's test. Finkelstein's test involves making a fist over the thumb and pushing the uh, fist ulnary against the patient's force. Differential diagnosis of the Quervain's tendosynovitis includes osteoarthritis of the carpometal carpal joint, rower's wrist, and isolated neuropathy of the radial nerve superficialis. The treatment for the Quervain's tendosynovitis initially involves conservative measures such as explaining the cause, providing instructions on load management, and possibly injecting corticosteroids into the tendon sheet, not into the tendon itself. In some cases, immobilization of the wrist and thumb in a splint or plaster may be necessary. If conservative treatment fails, surgical decompression can be performed by incising and leaving the tendon sheet open. However, the procedure carries a risk of injury to the superficialis cutaneous branch of the radial nerve. Volkmann contracture. Volkmann contracture, a late stage complication of compartment syndrome in the forearm, results from prolonged extensive pressure on the muscle compartments, leading to muscle necrosis and fibrosis. It typically occurs following supracondylar fractures of the humerus or forearm fractures, especially when vascular injury is present. Early recognition of the compartment syndrome, including fasciotomy, can prevent Volkmann contracture. Symptoms include pain during passive stretching, prosthesias in the medial nerve distribution, and edema in the flexor compartment. 
Treatment involves tendon lengthening and muscle transpositions to improve the deformity and functioning of the affected hand. The next chapter is on wrist disorders. The wrist is a complex joint made up of eight carpal bones arranged in two rows. Ligaments connect these bones to each other, the forearm and the metacarpals. The first row of the wrist consists of the scaphoid, the lunate, the pisiform and the triquatrum. The second row consists of the hamate, capitate, trapezium and trapezoid. The scaphoid and the lunate bones are especially vulnerable to injuries. Late consequences of wrist injury include pseudoarthrosis of the scaphoid, carpal instability and disorders of the ulnar disc and triangular fibrocartilaginous complex. Pseudoarthrosis of the os scaphoidium. Scaphoid fractures are common and often overlooked during initial examination. They can lead to pseudoarthrosis, a condition characterized by pain and reduced dorsiflexion of the wrist. X-ray examination typically reveals a line formation and sclerosis between the two parts of the scaphoid bone. For fractures in the middle and distal part of the scaphoid, immobilization may still be effective in promoting healing even six months after the fracture. However, fractures of the proximal half of the scaphoidium often lead to avascular necrosis of the proximal part. If both bone fragments are intact and there is no avascular necrosis, then surgical reconstruction using a bone graft and possible screw fixation is indicated. Uh, the procedure by Matty Roos. Proper alignment of the fractured scaphoid fragments is crucial to prevent buckling of the scaphoid and premature osteoarthritis, which can negatively impact wrist function. In the presence of established osteoarthritis due to pseudoarthrosis or avascular necrosis of the scaphoid, Partial wrist arthrodesis is the preferred treatment. This procedure effectively reduces pain while preserving reasonable wrist mobility. Ligamentous instability of the wrist. Wrist injury, whether or not accompanied by a scaphoid fracture, can cause instability of the wrist. The most common instability is between the scaphoid and the lunate. The risk of this instability after an injury is higher if the ulna is relatively short compared to the radius. In congenital synostosis in the wrist, Ligament damage is also more likely to occur following trauma. As with scaphoid fracture, the cause of the injury is often a fall on the extended wrist. Even with this injury, the severity is often not initially recognized during x-ray examination, causing persistent pain and functional impairment of the wrist. The instability in the wrist occurs because the carpal bones no longer move as a fixed chain in their original direction relative to each other. Depending on the location of the injury, an instability may arise in which the distal part of the lunate points dorsally or in which the distal part of the lunate points ventrally. The dorsal intercalated segment instability, DC, or the ventral intercalated segment instability, VC. In these cases of instability, only surgical treatment using a partial arthrodesis is often useful. Lesions of the triangular fibrocartilaginous complex. The triangular fibrocartilaginous complex, the TFCC, is a crucial component of the wrist joint, connecting the ulna to the radius and providing stability to the wrist. The FCC injuries can occur due to the forceful twisting of the wrist, often during ulnar deviation. Symptoms include pain in the region of the dorsal depression distal to the ulnar head or over the ulnar styloid process, exacerbated by passive manipulation of the wrist. Differential diagnosis include the tendinopathy of the extensor carpi ulnaris muscle, Diagnosis is confirmed through magnetic resonance imaging or arthrography. In a number of cases the symptoms diminish with prolonged rest and in other cases a lengthening of the ulna, a shortening of the radius or a partial arthrodesis of the wrist should be considered. In case of extensive abnormalities a radiocarpal arthrodesis or a carpectomy of the proximal row is recommended. That is removal of the scaphoid, the lunate and the tequatrum. Lunatomalacia, Keenbox disease. Lunatomalacia, an avascular necrosis of the lunate, is a condition with unclear etiology. Often associated with microtrauma, it is more prevalent in individuals with heavy, vibrating intensive occupations, such as pneumatic drill operators and those with relatively short ulna compared to the radius. Symptoms typically manifest as pain localized around the lunate and ulna, accompanied by functional limitations of the wrist joint. Extension of the middle finger can be particularly painful. As the avascular lunate collapses progressively, osteoarthritis of the entire wrist joint may develop. Diagnosis relies on x-ray. 
which may reveal bone densification sclerosis or collapse consolidation. MRI scans are particularly useful in the early stage of the condition. Treatment options include prolonged rest, ulnar lengthening, radial shortening or partial wrist arthrodesis. In case of extensive abnormalities, radiocarpal arthrodesis or carpectomy of the proximal row may be recommended. Ganglion A ganglion is a fluid-filled cyst that commonly occurs near joints or tendon sheets in the wrist. Approximately 60% of ganglia appear on the dorsal side of the wrist between the lunate and scaphoid, while 20% develop on the volar side between the flexor carpi radialis muscle and the abductor pollicis longus muscle. Ganglions typically present as slow-growing, well-defined swellings that are not attached to the skin and cause minimal pain. They have a soft, rubbery texture and a slightly fluctuating shape. Differential diagnosis of a ganglion includes bone or soft tissue tumors. In most cases, simply explaining the condition to the patient is sufficient treatment. The majority of the ganglia resolve spontaneously within one to two years. If necessary, aspiration of a ganglion fluid and injection of corticosteroids can be performed, but this procedure has a 50% recurrence rate. Surgery is an option if conservative treatment fails, but even surgical excision carries a 10 to 20% risk of recurrence. Carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome, CTS, is a common nerve compression that affects the polar side of the wrist and forearm. It occurs when the median nerve located in the forearm becomes trapped under the flexor retinaculum, a band of tissue that connects the carpal bones. The narrowing of the carpal tunnel can be caused by various factors, including synovitis, tenosynovitis or fracture. CTS is more prevalent among women between the ages of 40 and 50 years and can also develop during pregnancy due to fluid retention. Typical symptoms of CTS include numbness, tingling and burning sensations, particularly at night, in the middle three fingers and sometimes in the thumb. In advanced stages, CTS can lead to muscle weakness and atrophy of the thumb muscle. Treatment for CTS typically starts with conservative measures such as exercise modification, splinting and medication. An injection of corticosteroids around the nervous medianus in the carpal tunnel may reduce symptoms for a long time. In case of long-term complaints, motor deficits can be detected on an EMG. Surgical treatment, in which the ligament carpi transversum of the wrist is cleaved, gives a good result. A rare counterpart of CTS is ulnar nerve compression in Guyon's canal, which can present with muscle atrophy of the little finger, but no sensory disturbances. Treatment for this condition also involves surgical decompression. The next chapter is on hand disorders. Osteoarthritis of the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb. EMC1 osteoarthritis is a degenerative condition affecting the joint at the base of the thumb, primarily afflicting women over 40 years of age. Differential diagnosis includes Duquefer tendophaginitis and tendinopathy of the flexor carpi radialis or flexor pollicis longus muscle. Carpal tunnel syndrome often co-occurs with CMC1 osteoarthritis. Symptoms include pain upon axial compression and joint movement, abduction contracture of the CMC1 joint and hyperextension deformity of the MCP joint. Treatment options include patient education, activity modification and local intraarticular corticosteroid injection, which often provides long-lasting relief. For persistent symptoms, arthrodesis of the CMC1 joint or partial resection of the arthritic trapezium bone are considered. Both procedures have comparable outcomes, but resection often fa uh, offers faster recovery and fewer complaints. Skiers, gamekeeper thumb, also called ulnar ligament injury of the MCP1 joint. The skier's thumb, an injury to the ulnar collateral ligament of the MCP1 joint, typically arises from a forceful impact on the thumb, such as falling with ski poles trapped on the hand or recoiling from a rifle held over the arm. Symptoms include tenderness over the ulnar aspect of the joint and notable instability in the radial direction of the MCP joint. Radiographs may reveal an increased space within the joint. Treatment depends on the ligament's condition. If the ligament ends remain aligned, immobilization in a splint for three weeks is adequate. However, if the distal end of the ligament has folded behind the adductor aponeurosis, causing permanent instability, surgical repair is necessary. Failure to address this issue promptly may require a secondary reconstruction. Trigger finger. Trigger finger arises from localized tenosynovitis of the flexor tendons at the metacarpal phalangeal joint level. 
characterized by a painful clicking sensation during finger flexion and extension due to the inflamed nodule passing through the tendon sheath. This condition commonly affects the middle or ring finger and sometimes the thumb. In diabetic patients, inflammation may involve multiple flexor tendons simultaneously. Treatment options include corticosteroid injections into the tendon sheet, providing long-lasting relief in many cases. For recurrent cases, surgical release of the tendon sheet, also called the A1 pulley, is an effective option. Position deviation of the fingers. Dupuytren contracture, a condition characterized by progressive flexion deformities of the finger, arises from the proliferation of myofibroblasts in the palmar fascia, predominantly affecting older individuals. This condition typically presents with fixed flexion contractures of the MCP, PIP and sometimes the DIP joints, often initiating in the little and rim fingers. Bilateral involvement occurs in approximately half of cases, with a higher prevalence in Northern Europe. Initial symptoms often manifest as fibrous nodules over the pretendinous bands in the palm. And treatment options include corticosteroid injections for nodule management, selective fasciectomy as the gold standard surgical approach, percutaneous needle fasciotomy for minimally invasive treatment, and collagenase clostridium histolyticum injections followed by finger manipulation. While the long-term efficacy of the collagenase injections remains unclear, it offers a promising alternative treatment modality. Position deviation of the fingers, butonnaire malformation. Botonnière deformity, a common complication of rheumatoid arthritis, stems from inflammation of the pip joint capsule, causing elongation and subluxation of the extensor tendon. This results in a fixed flexion deformity of the pip joint and a reactive hyperextension of the dip joint, resembling a butonnière, we call it, it's French for collar button. Treatment is primarily surgical, but achieving satisfactory outcomes can be challenging due to the underlying rheumatoid arthritis. Position deviations of the fingers, swan neck malformation. Swan neck deformity is a condition characterized by hyperextension of the middle joint and flexion of the end joint, giving the finger a swan-like neck appearance. The exact cause is complex and multifaceted, but it is particularly prevent prevalent in individuals with rheumatoid arthritis. The deformity manifests as a subluxation of the MCP joint, hyperextension of the pip joint, and flexion of the dip joint. Early interventions with splinting and potential synovectomy can help prevent further worsening of the deformity. In severe cases, surgical reconstruction of the extensor mechanism and reduction of the MCP joint may be necessary. Infections around the hand. Due to the interconnected nature of tendon sheets in the hand, infections can rapidly spread throughout the hand and wrist. Prompt treatment is crucial to prevent irreversible damage and residual abnormalities. Any infection in the hand or wrist should be considered an emergency and treated immediately. The paronychia is an infection of the cuticle that extends under the nail. It is often caused by a combination of aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. The infection manifests as redness, swelling, and possibly purulent secretion under the cuticle. Treatment involves draining the infection using a wet bandage. Surgical drainage may, necessarily, may be necessary in some cases. Paronychia can be challenging to treat if it is caused by a fungal infection such as Candida albicans. Uncus incarnatus. Ingrown fingernails, often caused by improper trimming, can lead to secondary infection and abscess formation beneath the nail fold. Treatment typically involves partial nail excision and in cases of recurrent ingrown nails, complete nail extraction may be necessary. The hand abscess is an infection that affects both the palmar and dorsal side of the hand. It typically arises from an infection of the callus on the palmar side, possibly due to an infected blister. The infection can spread through the dorsal side because the palmar skin is tightly adhered to the underlying palmar fascia. This also limits palmar extension. This results in swelling on both the palmar and dorsal side of the hand, accompanied by abduction of the fingers on both sides of the interdigital space. Treatment involves incision and drainage of the abscess on both the palmar and dorsal side to ensure adequate drainage of the infection. Handflegmon. A hand phlegmon is a severe soft tissue infection that develops from an untreated hand abscess. It involves extensive inflammation and swelling of the soft tissues on both the palmar and dorsal side of the hand. Treatment is primarily surgical and consists of extensive drainage to remove the accumulated pus and promote healing. 
purulent tenosynovitis of the flexors. Flexor tendon sheath synovitis is an inflammation of the synovial sheaths that surround the flexor tendons in the fingers. The sheaths of the index digitus 1 and little finger digitus 5 extend into the wrist, allowing infection to spread to this area. In contrast, infections tend to remain localized in the shorter tendon sheaths of the flexor of the middle finger, ring finger and little finger. To distinguish between flexor tendon sheaths, synovitis and localized abscess, it's important to check for pain when passively stretching a finger. In all cases of flexor tendon sheath synovitis, surgical drainage is required. This involves opening and rinsing the inflamed tendon sheath to remove pus and promote healing. You can show appreciation for the content by liking, subscribing or commenting on the video.